This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 34 Nearly three weeks had elapsed since the second visit of Marnu, and it must have been more than four months since I entered the valley, when one day about noon, and whilst everything was in profound silence, Mau Mau, the one-eyed chief, suddenly appeared at the door, and leaning forward towards me as I lay directly facing him, said in a low tone, Toby pay me ena. Toby has arrived here. Gracious heaven! What a tumult of emotions rushed upon me at this startling intelligence! Insensible to the pain that had before distracted me, I leaped to my feet, and called wildly to Kori Kori, who was reposing by my side. The startled islanders sprang from their mats, the news was quickly communicated to them, and the next moment I was making my way to the tea on the back of Kori Kori, and surrounded by the excited savages. All that I could comprehend of the particulars which Mau Mau rehearsed to his auditors as we proceeded, was that my long-lost companion had arrived in a boat which had just entered the bay. These tidings made me most anxious to be carried at once to the sea, lest some untoward circumstance should prevent our meeting. But to this they would not consent, and continued their course towards the royal abode. As we approached it, Mahavi and several chiefs showed themselves from the piazza, and called upon us loudly to come to them. As soon as we had approached, I endeavored to make them understand that I was going down to the sea to meet Toby. To this the king objected, and motioned Kori Kori to bring me into the house. It was in vain to resist, and in a few moments I found myself within the tea, surrounded by a noisy group engaged in discussing the recent intelligence. Toby's name was frequently repeated, coupled with violent exclamations of astonishment. It seemed as if they yet remained in doubt with regard to the fact of his arrival, and at every fresh report that was brought from the shore, they betrayed the liveliest emotions. Almost frenzied at being held in this state of suspense, I passionately besought Mahavi to permit me to proceed. Whether my companion had arrived or not, I felt a presentiment that my own fate was about to be decided. Again and again I renewed my petition to Mahavi. He regarded me with a fixed and serious eye, but at length, yielding to my importunity, reluctantly granted my request. Accompanied by some fifty of the natives, I now rapidly continued my journey, every few moments being transferred from the back of one to another, and urging my bearer forward all the while with earnest entreaties. As I thus hurried forward, no doubt as to the truth of the information I had received ever crossed my mind. I was alive only to the one overwhelming idea, that a chance of deliverance was now afforded me, if the jealous opposition of the savages could be overcome. Having been prohibited from approaching the sea during the whole of my stay in the valley, I had always associated with it the idea of escape. Toby, too, if indeed he had ever voluntarily deserted me, must have effected his flight by the sea, and now that I was drawing near to it myself, I indulged in hopes which I had never felt before. It was evident that a boat had entered the bay, and I saw little reason to doubt the truth of the report that it had brought my companion. Every time, therefore, that we gained an elevation, I looked eagerly around, hoping to behold him. In the midst of an excited throng, who by their violent gestures and wild cries appeared to be under the influence of some excitement as strong as my own, I was now borne along at a rapid trot, frequently stooping my head to avoid the branches which crossed the path, and never ceasing to implore those who carried me to accelerate their already swift pace. In this manner we had proceeded about four or five miles, when we were met by a party of some twenty islanders, between whom and those who accompanied me, ensued an animated conference. Impatient of the delay occasioned by this interruption, I was beseeching the man who carried me to proceed without his loitering companions, when Kori Kori, running to my side, informed me, in three fatal words, that the news had all proved false, that Toby had not arrived. Toby Auli Pemi. 
heaven only knows how, in the state of mind and body I then was, I ever sustained the agony which this intelligence caused me. Not that the news was altogether unexpected, but I had trusted that the fact might not have been made known until we should have arrived upon the beach. As it was, I at once foresaw the course the savages would pursue. They had only yielded thus far to my entreaties that I might give a joyful welcome to my long-absent comrade. But now that it was known he had not arrived, they would at once oblige me to turn back. My anticipations were but too correct. In spite of the resistance I made, they carried me into a house which was near the spot, and left me upon the mats. Shortly afterwards, several of those who had accompanied me from the tea, detaching themselves from the others, proceeded in the direction of the sea. Those who remained, among whom were Marheyo, Mau Mau, Kori Kori, and Tinor, gathered about the dwelling, and appeared to be awaiting their return. This convinced me that strangers, perhaps some of my own countrymen, had for some cause or other entered the bay. Distracted at the idea of their vicinity, and reckless of the pain which I suffered, I heeded not the assurances of the islanders that there were no boats at the beach, but starting to my feet endeavored to gain the door. Instantly the passage was blocked up by several men, who commanded me to resume my seat. The fierce looks of the irritated savages admonished me that I could gain nothing by force, and that it was by entreaty alone that I could hope to compass my object. Guided by this consideration, I turned to Mau Mau, the only chief present whom I had been much in the habit of seeing, and carefully concealing my real design, tried to make him comprehend that I still believed Toby to have arrived on the shore, and besought him to allow me to go forward to welcome him. To all his repeated assertions that my companion had not been seen, I pretended to turn a deaf ear while I urged my solicitations with an eloquence of gesture which the one-eyed chief appeared unable to resist. He seemed indeed to regard me as a froward child, to whose wishes he had not the heart to oppose force, and whom he must consequently humor. He spoke a few words to the natives, who at once retreated from the door, and I immediately passed out of the house. Here I looked earnestly round for Cory Cory but that hitherto faithful servitor was nowhere to be seen. Unwilling to linger even for a single instant when every moment might be so important, I motioned to a muscular fellow near me to take me upon his back. To my surprise, he angrily refused. I turned to another, but with a like result. A third attempt was as unsuccessful, and I immediately perceived what had induced Mau Mau to grant my request and why the other natives conducted themselves in so strange a manner. It was evident that the chief had only given me liberty to continue my progress towards the sea, because he supposed that I was deprived of the means of reaching it. Convinced by this of their determination to retain me a captive, I became desperate, and almost insensible to the pain which I suffered, I seized a spear which was leaning against the projecting eaves of the house, and supporting myself with it, resumed the path that swept by the dwelling. To my surprise I was suffered to proceed alone, all the natives remaining in front of the house and engaging in earnest conversation, which every moment became more loud and vehement, and to my unspeakable delight I perceived that some difference of opinion had arisen between them, that two parties in short were formed, and consequently that in their divided councils there was some chance of my deliverance. Before I had proceeded a hundred yards I was again surrounded by the savages, who were still in all the heat of argument, and appeared every moment as if they would come to blows. In the midst of this tumult, old Marheyo came to my side, and I shall never forget the benevolent expression of his countenance. He placed his arm upon my shoulder, and emphatically pronounced the only two English words I had taught him, Home and Mother. I at once understood what he meant, and eagerly expressed my thanks to him. Fayawe and Kori Kori were by his side, both weeping violently, and it was not until the old man had twice repeated the command that his son could bring himself to obey him, and take me again upon his back. The one-eyed chief opposed his doing so, but he was overruled, and, as it seemed to me, 
by some of his own party. We proceeded onwards, and never shall I forget the ecstasy I felt when I first heard the roar of the surf breaking upon the beach. Before long I saw the flashing billows themselves through the opening between the trees. O oh, glorious sight and sound of ocean! With what rapture did I hail you as familiar friends! By this time the shouts of the crowd upon the beach were distinctly audible, and in the blended confusion of sounds I almost fancied I could distinguish the voices of my own countrymen. When we reached the open space which lay between the groves and the sea, the first object that met my view was an English whaleboat, lying with her bow pointed from the shore, and only a few fathoms distant from it. It was manned by five islanders, dressed in short tunics of calico. My first impression was that they were in the very act of pulling out from the bay, and that after all my exertions I had come too late. My soul sunk within me, but a second glance convinced me that the boat was only hanging off to keep out of the surf, and the next moment I heard my own name shouted out by a voice from the midst of the crowd. Looking in the direction of the sound, I perceived, to my indescribable joy, the tall figure of Karakoi, an Oahu Kanaka, who had often been aboard the dolly while she lay in Nukahiva. He wore the green shooting jacket with gilt buttons, which had been given to him by an officer of the Reine Blanche, the French flagship, and in which I had always seen him dressed. I now remembered the Kanaka had frequently told me that his person was tabooed in all the valleys of the island and the sight of him at such a moment as this filled my heart with a tumult of delight. Kurakoi stood near the edge of the water, with a large roll of cotton cloth thrown over one arm, and holding two or three canvas bags of powder, while with the other hand he grasped a musket, which he appeared to be proffering to several of the chiefs around him. But they turned with disgust from his offers, and seemed to be impatient at his presence with vehement gestures, waving him off to his boat, and commanding him to depart. The Kanaka, however, still maintained his ground, and I at once perceived that he was seeking to purchase my freedom. Animated by the idea, I called upon him loudly to come to me, but he replied in broken English that the islanders had threatened to pierce him with their spears if he stirred a foot towards me. At this time I was still advancing, surrounded by a dense throng of the natives, several of whom had their hands upon me, and more than one javelin was threateningly pointed at me. Still I perceived clearly that many of those least friendly towards me looked irresolute and anxious. I was still some thirty yards from Karakoe when my farther progress was prevented by the natives, who compelled me to sit down upon the ground, while they still retained their hold upon my arms. The din and tumult now became tenfold, and I perceived that several of the priests were on the spot, all of whom were evidently urging Mau Mau and the other chiefs to prevent my departure, and the detestable word, Rune, Rune, which I had heard repeated a thousand times during the day, was now shouted out on every side of me. Still I saw that the Kanaka continued his exertions in my favor, that he was boldly debating the matter with the savages, and was striving to entice them by displaying his cloth and powder, and snapping the lock of his musket. But all he said or did appeared only to augment the clamors of those around him, who seemed bent upon driving him into the sea. When I remembered the extravagant value placed by these people upon the articles which were offered to them in exchange for me, and which were so indignantly rejected, I saw a new proof of the same fixed determination of purpose they had all along manifested with regard to me, and in despair, and reckless of consequences, I exerted all my strength, and shaking myself free from the grasp of those who held me, I sprung upon my feet and rushed towards Karakoi. The rash attempt nearly decided my fate, for, fearful that I might slip from them, several of the islanders now raised a simultaneous shout, and pressing upon Karakoi, they menaced him with furious gestures, and actually forced him into the sea. Appalled at their violence, the poor fellow, standing nearly to the waist in the surf, endeavored to pacify them. But at length, fearful that they would do him some fatal violence, he beckoned to his comrades to pull in at once, and take him into the boat. It was at this agonizing moment, 
when I thought all hope was ended, that a new contest arose between the two parties who had accompanied me to the shore. Blows were struck, wounds were given, and blood flowed. In the interest excited by the fray, every one had left me except Marheyo, Kori Kori, and poor, dear Fayaway, who clung to me, sobbing indignantly. I saw that now or never was the moment. Clasping my hands together, I looked imploringly at Marheyo, and moved towards the now almost deserted beach. The tears were in the old man's eyes, but neither he nor Kori Kori attempted to hold me, and I soon reached the Kanaka, who had been anxiously watching my movements. The rowers pulled in as near as they dared to the edge of the surf. I gave one parting embrace to Fayaway, who seemed speechless with sorrow, and the next instant I found myself safe in the boat, and Karakoi by my side, who told the rowers at once to give way. Marheo and Kori Kori, and a great many of the women, followed me into the water, and I was determined, as the only mark of gratitude I could show, to give them the articles which had been brought as my ransom. I handed the musket to Kori Kori, with a rapid gesture which was equivalent to a deed of gift, threw the roll of cotton to old Marheo, pointing as I did so to poor Fayaway, who had retired from the edge of the water, and was sitting down disconsolate on the shingles and tumbled the powder-bags out to the nearest young ladies, all of whom were vastly willing to take them. This distribution did not occupy ten seconds, and before it was over, the boat was under full way, the Kanaka all the while exclaiming loudly against what he considered a useless throwing away of valuable property. Although it was clear that my movements had been noticed by several of the natives, still they had not suspended the conflict in which they were engaged, and it was not until the boat was above fifty yards from the shore that Mau Mau and some six or seven other warriors rushed into the sea and hurled their javelins at us. Some of the weapons passed quite as close to us as was desirable, but no one was wounded, and the men pulled away gallantly. But although soon out of the reach of the spears, our progress was extremely slow. It blew strong upon the shore, and the tide was against us, and I saw Karakoi, who was steering the boat, give many a look towards a jutting point of the bay round which we had to pass. For a minute or two after our departure, the savages, who had formed into different groups, remained perfectly motionless and silent. All at once the enraged chief showed by his gestures that he had resolved what course he would take. Shouting loudly to his companions, and pointing with his tomahawk towards the headland, he set off at full speed in that direction, and was followed by about thirty of the natives, among whom were several of the priests, all yelling out, Rune, Rune, at the very top of their voices. Their intention was evidently to swim off from the headland, and intercept us in our course. The wind was freshening every minute, and was right in our teeth, and it was one of those chopping angry seas in which it is so difficult to row. Still the chances seemed in our favor. But when we came within a hundred yards of the point, the active savages were already dashing into the water, and we all feared that within five minutes' time we should have a score of the infuriated wretches around us. If so, our doom was sealed, for these savages, unlike the feeble swimmers of civilized countries, are, if anything, more formidable antagonists in the water than when on the land. It was all a trial of strength. Our natives pulled till their oars bent again and the crowd of swimmers shot through the water, despite its roughness, with fearful rapidity. By the time we had reached the headland, the savages were spread right across our course. Our rowers got out their knives, and held them ready between their teeth, and I seized the boat-hook. We were well aware that if they succeeded in intercepting us, they would practice upon us the maneuver which has proved so fatal to many a boat's crew in these seas. They would grapple the oars, and seizing hold of the gunwale, capsize the boat, and then we should be entirely at their mercy. After a few breathless moments I discerned Mau Mau. The athletic islander, with his tomahawk between his teeth, was dashing the water before him till it foamed again. He was the nearest to us, and in another instant he would have seized one of the oars. Even at the moment I felt horror at the act I was about to commit but it was no time for pity or compunction, 
and with a true aim, and exerting all my strength, I dashed the boat-hook at him. It struck him just below the throat, and forced him downwards. I had no time to repeat my blow, but I saw him rise to the surface in the wake of the boat, and never shall I forget the ferocious expression of his countenance. Only one other of the savages reached the boat. He seized the gunwale, but the knives of our rowers so mauled his wrists that he was forced to quit his hold, and the next minute we were past them all, and in safety. The strong excitement which had thus far kept me up now left me, and I fell back fainting into the arms of Karakoi. The circumstances connected with my most unexpected escape may be very briefly stated. The captain of an Australian vessel, being in distress for men in these remote seas, had put into Nukahiva in order to recruit his ship's company, but not a single man was to be obtained, and the bark was about to get under way when she was boarded by Karakoi, who informed the disappointed Englishman that an American sailor was detained by the savages in the neighboring bay of Taipee, and he offered, if supplied with suitable articles of traffic, to undertake his release. The Kanaka had gained his intelligence from Marnu, to whom, after all, I was indebted for my escape. The proposition was acceded to, and Karakoi, taking with him five tabooed natives of Nukahiva, again repaired aboard the bark, which in a few hours sailed to that part of the island, and threw her main topsail aback right off the entrance to the Taipei Bay. The whaleboat, manned by the tabooed crew, pulled towards the head of the inlet, while the ship lay off and on, awaiting its return. The events which ensued have already been detailed, and little more remains to be related. On reaching the Julia, I was lifted over the side, and my strange appearance and remarkable adventure occasioned the liveliest interest. Every attention was bestowed upon me that humanity could suggest. But to such a state was I reduced, that three months elapsed before I recovered my health. The mystery which hung over the fate of my friend and companion Toby has never been cleared up. I still remain ignorant whether he succeeded in leaving the valley, or perished at the hands of the islanders.